All right, it looks like we're getting on people coming in. I'm gonna give a, another moment or two to get people started, but um, I just wanted to start off by saying thank you to everybody who's come in here. Um, and thank you to some of the clubs that have been able to kind of reach out on, on our behalf and get the word out of everything we're doing. Clubs like Albany Berkeley, Girls Leading Girls, Bay Area Girls Unite, San Francisco Vikings, the Glens, the Golden Gate Women's Soccer League, of course, uh, Scores Independent Football Club, and a lot of the uh, Scores coaches I know are coming on themselves to see a lot of what we have going on. So we really appreciate all of that. Thank you so much for coming on. We're really excited. Um, it's going to be a really exciting show. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, America Scores and what we're doing and what the organization's uh, goals are. Uh, and then I'm going to pass it off to Rachel at Women in, Women in Soccer, who has been a huge uh, force in making this happen and supporting everything that we're doing. And then, of course, this star Tracy is going to come in and talk a little bit about the journey that we're about to go on together. Um, so I'll get started uh, telling you a little bit uh, about America Scores. If you haven't heard of us, we're a nonprofit that sets up free after school programs to try to bring soccer poetry and community service to kids in the Bay Area. Um, so we're gonna be the home of the poet athlete activist. We set up to speak for ourselves, for our teams and to speak for our communities. We're trying to provide this programming for free to all people within the Bay Area, all of the kids, elementary and middle school and to all genders. Our goal is to have at least 50% girls on all our teams. We're at about 60, 40 now, uh, and we're pushing to, to get better and better each season and each year. Um, but ultimately, if we wanna do that, we need help from, from you, from uh, women leaders and women, culture, co women coaches to come on and create that programming, to create this vision and make it happen. So I want to, after all of this, follow up with all of you to come on and help us volunteer to come on as, as coaches. We have a leadership council within America Scores as well that needs more women on it. Um, and we want y'all to come on, work with you to help uh, create that vision together, really to be leaders in deciding what happens with a lot of our programming as well. So hopefully that's uh, something that y'all can really support and come together with. And we really appreciate that. One of the, again, biggest supporters that we've had is women in soccer recently. So I'll pass it off for Rachel to tell you a little bit about them and the mission that they have. Thanks so much, Paul. Hi, everyone. We're so stoked to be here. As Paul mentioned, I'm Rachel, Managing Director over at Women in Soccer. America Scores not only in the Bay Area, but all around the country is doing unbelievable things. Um, they didn't ask me to say this, but I highly recommend getting after support for them. They really go out and put their best foot forward um, with such a strong mission behind making a more equitable and inclusive world. So we are so stoked to be here and partner with them. For those that do not know us, we are a new network on a mission to connect all women that love the beautiful game. Whether people are on the field or cheering from the stands or they work in the game or they wanna be in the game, working in the game, or you're just really passionate about change making like supporting organizations like Mark Scores, our network is here to support you. Um, we currently have membership tiers in four different ways and they all are completely free. And our goal right now is to get people in to explore what we have inside of our platform. We offer job opportunities in soccer and out, a community for all women, any type of any background, any which way we are entirely rooted in inclusivity and we want to see you there as well as allies like Paul, like JT Hanley, who is joining us as well. And we also offer personal and professional development opportunities. So the first thing you would do is decide which membership type is right for you. And then you jump in and get to create a player card with your own personal stats and you get to come to awesome events like this. Please check us out, womeninsoccer.org. Thanks, Maria, for that note in the chat. Um, we would love to see you in there. And truly, this is about a mission to help more women be seen and be, be heard inside of this beautiful game um, and help create a more equitable industry. 
So without further ado, Tracy Hamm, who is one of our board members at Women in Soccer, and also the star of this incredible film, Coach, that was um, produced by the founder of Women in Soccer, I hand it to you to give us an intro to the film and then get us started. Awesome. Thanks, Rach, and everyone for joining. I'm so excited. Um, also, I, I was, uh, when I was at San Francisco State coaching, when a lot of this was filmed, um, the players volunteered with America Scores, and it was like one of the best, honestly, opportunities that they've had um, throughout my four years there. It was like the favorite, my, their favorite, most charitable experience, and they really, really looked forward to it. So if you um, are looking for an organization to get involved in, it's highly recommended. They love the soccer poets. They thought it was so fun. And um, so highly recommend that. And again, thank you for hosting this. Um, I'm pumped and excited to share this with you. Um, so kind of going along with what Rachel said was um, this women in soccer is such an incredible organization that really kind of started from coach and the movie coach highlights a lot of the nuances and subtleties that women are faced with um, in a predominantly male driven industry. And, um, but it's also a movie that kind of shows hope and resilience um, in the face of adversity. And we were able to create a really special organization um, from highlighting these conversations that need to happen. Um, so I'm really excited to show you every, every, I think some of you have probably already seen it, but a second watch isn't bad. Um, I've seen it about 800 times and it's still exciting to me. Um, I actually kind of feel like I watch someone else on screen now, but uh, I think it's just a really, really powerful movie for um, any coaches in the room, any fans in the room, um, parents and, you know, cousins, any sort of ally and advocate for women in soccer. So please enjoy. And after the film, um, I'll be talking through a couple different things and we'll be open for questions. So roll it. <laughs> Well, we so okay, cool. If you can tell us a story about the poem. Oh my gosh, yeah. I think this is seventh grade and uh, my coach at the time, he wanted us to write it. So it's called Why I Made the State Team. I play soccer for the love of the game. I try to stand out so people will remember my name. I always work hard. Without soccer, I'd be left scarred. My passion shows in my play. I'll bring my game anytime, any day. The worst feeling is when I've lost, so I play with strength as soon as the coin is tossed. Without soccer, I'd be incomplete. How would I show off the quickness of my feet? Yo juego al football 24 seven. When I'm on the field, I'm in heaven. I try with hustle, strength, and speed. I still won't give up, even if we take the lead. My skills aren't that great, but I guess making the team was my fate. I'll try and learn as much as I can. At the same time, I can work on my tan. like she plays. She's a force. She's never someone that's just flying under the radar. She's very driven, very motivated. She's brave and bold and confident. You can't teach confidence like that. When I was little, I grew up with two brothers. Everything was a competition all the time for either attention, bragging rights, and I had to rise above to be included in things if I wanted to be allowed to play with them. soccer was being like so upset when the ball would go out of bounds because there was like a pause and play. This girl 
was taking a really long time to throw the ball in. I ran over to her, I pulled the ball out of her hands, I threw it into myself so we could keep going. I remember the kids being very confused, like, she's not allowed to do that. I'm like, this is taking eternity, so we need to get on this. She came into our office, strolls into, you know, all biceps and just strong as anything. And we're sitting there, you know, Tracy, good to see you. She's like, hey, coaches. She looks at this board. We have this whiteboard where we have three years of recruiting on. We don't show people this, but we have them in positions who we're going to lose one year, who we're thinking of bringing in. We got this on the wall. She goes, looks at the whiteboard and starts moving players around. Girls she's playing with in the club system, I really like her, she would be great at center back. And this girl, no, she's out, she has bad attitude. She doesn't work hard enough. To, I mean, seriously, the people who came were, it was largely because of Tracy Ham. And it was just, for us, it was an indicator as coaches were like, someday she is going to take our jobs. Coaching wasn't something I really considered as a career. Playing soccer in college is just an experience and it's kind of a natural progression from being a, you know, a good female athlete and you go play in college and then you kind of start your life. You don't have to stop playing and you don't have to stop being involved in the game. This is a viable career. It's something that if you feel that much passion about, you can make a difference okay, in so student athletes' right lives. Here. And it's gotta be a driven ball. Okay, so not not super lofted, so mess like the normal ones that you hit. Okay, driven because we don't want she to She sets the bar really, really high. Ball and invites her players to get there. So she will run next to them. She will do push-ups next to them. Okay. She will be so by here. their side. Good, I'm pulling away, pulling away, pulling away. Good, here, and it needs to be more pace, right? So we can actually hit a shot. Everything's I expect nice a lot from my players, up. mainly effort. Effort and attitude, because those are the two controllables, the X's and the O's and the tactical side. That's secondary to having the right mentality. Right, And your player on the ball is looking down. Help them make a decision, right? Make each other better. Okay, last piece, it's a big game. Okay, big time players show up for big time games. Very, very simple. You go out, you do your job, and you get your win. Yeah, let's go. My oldest has been playing for seven years now. As soon as she started club, she had male coaches. However, when she got a strong female coach the first time, I could tell there was more of a, I can see myself in this role. I can see being a professional soccer player. She actually had the opportunity to return to a different club, and she decided to stay where she's at because of the female coach she has. Raise your hand if you're tired. Don't ever admit you're tired. Come on. Be like, no, coach, what's more? What kind of move could you do right now? Let's see it. Pull back. Boom. And then what are you going to do? Yes. Knock the ball in the air, trap it, and then find a new ball. There's no man that knows what it's like to be a female player. When you can be coached by a woman that's played at the top level, that knows what it's like to have that experience, and that knows how the game is growing for the woman, you know that that woman believes in you and believes into the height of what you can do, and there's really no limitation. Good. Step over. Circle turn right. Circle turn right. I've been coaching U19 boys, and in the past year and a half, I have been called mom by an opponent. Referees come up to whatever dad is on my sideline setting up our tent, asking for the lineup and the captains. We were down playing Santa Clara Sporting, a uh, top team in the country. And some boys got into a little altercation, you know, on the field, so I ran down to the other coach. So we were right there to, like, jump out and try to pull our boys apart. And behind me, I hear, there's a pussy on the field. Not you're a pussy, and I, not that I'm varying the adjective and noun form of pussy, but this 16-year-old boy said there's a pussy on the field. I mean, he called me a vagina. And I look at the ref, I'm like, you you heard that. You need to card that. And he's like, I will take care of that. I am very sorry, ma'am. You know, I'm like, I'm not ma'am. I'm coach. That's what I'm worried about.
I got some really great advice early on in my career. It's really competitive for women to get coaching positions, start getting licenses, and that's going to help you a lot. I'd always heard the licensing was more like a means to an end than an actual educational experience. I got my job at Santa Rosa JC where I was the head coach. I kind of had this moment where I was thinking, I might always be a head coach. There's no one that's going to mentor me moving forward. This is the only way I'm going to get better. As soon as you guys win the ball in the midfield, you are trying to and So the USSF it. is the governing body for the United States. They're the ones that the issue licenses. And the waiver requirements at the time were you had to have played three years professionally. Well, I played two years professionally, and they denied me. I graduated college in 2006. The pro league didn't start till 2009. So there was a three-year gap where there wasn't an opportunity to play professionally. That was the, the impetus and the catalyst for me to kind of look abroad and see what other licenses were out there. I grew up in Europe, so I've always known the, what the UEFA meant, and it always meant high class, high standards. UEFA is the governing body for all the European nations, basically, that have football, which they all have football. I thought initially that I would just stop after the B. The mentorship that I received from the instructors, they challenge you to the core. You just wanted to soak it all in the whole time that you were there. About six months after, I said, hey, we're going to do this international A. Like, we'd love for you to do it. That's the kind of accolade that it's basically like putting a World Cup medal in front of someone. She's prepared to stretch herself beyond what most people will do. It's not like you're just going down the road. I mean, she has to go all the way to Wales. It's a it's a complete boys club over there. So what she she's taken a, a step, a more brutal step in that direction. This license gives me the opportunity to coach any women's team in the world. I, I'm, I'm amazed by Tracy Hamm. Before we get into what we do, I want, first of all, can I have a show of hands? Are you currently working within a playing philosophy or game model? For my college team. For your college team. So you've developed a game model or philosophy for everybody to follow. Well, I mean, courses like this are invaluable, I think. Uh, you know, I've, I've started looking at the game much more in depth uh, rather than being so concentrated on um, what I was doing personally. I'm um, looking at the team, the you know, strategies, the uh, setups, formations. Work a lot on like, playing the way you face. So even if it's a pass forward, the next pass might be negative. So you can see this, if it's played quickly, now we're in a 2v1 in this situation, centre forward, staying quite narrow to try and occupy these two. Great position to stay I'm in. I've gone with the way of the UEFA badges. I was one of the first uh, Egyptian players to come to Europe and play at the top level, and I would like, I would like to do the same as a coach. You're going to come in ten times then, right? What reasons 
do you think I would have to come in and talk to you in that situation? Good? You found him? Well done. Play on. Play on. Good lad. One pull him back a bit. Right. Say, don't forget, oh when you get there, you're not, giving, you're not getting it back off him. Then. You're not getting sure. it. So you need to stop Maybe anything that goes through there. Stay narrow early, allow it to there, and then press. The so play that one then. Play that one, walk That's through it. Good. Now you're going to step back inside. Now that gap that he was trying so you've got to some options now. Okay, you've got some options. Is smaller and I'm going to give you two. The, two times the, where you can use this option. The second so first of all, when the ball goes into uh -huh. you, you get you away from the man. This is after the switch. switch. So I think right, he was just, just not Tracy's holding her own. She's proven her credentials in the in the room here. It's, it's quite well dominated. Forward. Okay, my second, my first touch yeah. will take me into a situation where my second touch is into you. Mm -hmm. Can you start beyond right? that one? She's a brave girl to study here and to educate herself, and you know that's not easy with all the travelling and the long distance. I You're taking like your first touch inside. So now again, in here, it's asking, important that you get away from them. So there's two options one. you've yeah. got. The last time he got it. I hope you go back now to the states and get this education into the into America and try to teach more girls about uh, about what, what's new and what's happening in the in the modern game <laughs> Watching a full game, 90 minutes. Team sheets are in the rooms for you. Hand notations will be there as well. It's going to be good key technical detail and tactical detail for the 12 minutes that you're on each. So we're going to go into it. Group one, Tracy, Mido, you're working together in the first group. And you're going to be looking at the game. So make sure that you look at the detail, the level of detail that we require. The idea being we're going to watch Manchester United. It's the whole game we're watching, but firstly you need to decide who's doing what really. <sighs> okay. Um, in terms of the delivery. I'd rather do out of possession. Out of possession and then transition out. to, uh, to out to win, yeah. yeah. Out to win. Manchester United playing three at the back. Yeah. Three, four, two, one. He's trying to match up with uh, with Conti. See the shape? Mm -hmm. Group work can be a definitely an interesting um, activity working with men. Um, there's a lot of explaining to me what's happening as opposed to discussing what's happening. They don't like happening. screw themselves anyhow, do they, in that, in that system? Or well, they didn't, I should no, say. No, they didn't have any no. attack no, well, that's What I mean, start. if you're asking one of the center backs to track all the way, to go up all the way, and now you ask the opposite full back, Valencia, if the ball on his side to stay. Mm -hmm. so he stayed like three. It's something that I've accepted, unfortunately, as being um, part of an industry that I probably won't change. But I can try to contribute to the conversation as much as possible. Kako didn't do anything. No. Well, and lunch. also the same they point is that he just wants to keep the ball in there. What I've ended up doing in environments like this is probably over explaining things just to show competence. I'm going to do that, and he does that, and he leaves him. I don't know what I'm talking about, let me speak. Well, this, what's his name? He just drops, but he's yep. not. he doesn't have pressure on the ball, mm. and he's not actually picking up a runner. Mm. So he's not sure where to go because he's not doing anything. Correct, and he, I mean, he's got some of their thoughts, he's, like I hadn't thought about that either, so it's great. It would just be better if it was more of like a discussion rather than like, so this is the formation they're playing. Like, okay, thank you. I've watched soccer before, so. Um, anyway, so. Tomorrow, when people have to present and use the tactics board, it shouldn't be as nerve-wracking as it is, because you know what you're talking about, but for whatever reason, it's like something that's scary. Like, I'll probably be nervous, even though I'm super comfortable talking in front of a group, but it's...
Non, là-haut, je te mets que tu veux te mettre à elle. I'm ready when you're ready. ready. Okay, so if it was a player with a little bit of experience when the ball was passed here, instead of selling himself, uh, sell, uh, himself out and making a tackle, he would have tracked back with him and it wouldn't have, have had any problems uh, for, for us. But this is a game that we will learn a lot uh, from. We know that we can do uh, better and uh, it's still early in the season and hopefully we can, we can uh, um, learn from our mistakes and take it to the next games. out of possession, uh, there was just three general trends that I was able to find. Um, the first one was in their attacking third, um, they're always high press, so... I got a little flustered. I forgot to move the ball. It appeared that they really just wanted to keep the ball in Chelsea's half the entire game. The tactics board was probably a little too tall for me, so I started sweating trying to like reach things. That ball was never an option because he was so deep. And even if he did receive it, he was already in his own half and they were able to organize. So Chelsea always had... I was glad I'm glad it's over. Uh, I know, I feel, I feel fine. I think I got my points across. In terms of that transitional moment from defense to attack when, you know, is usually a really great opportunity to take advantage of the team in transition. So that was it. Could it always be better and more effective and... Detail, sure, but that's okay. So, thank you very much for the last 12 months. Here's to a good next 12 months, and that's a wrap. So, all better. Absolutely, too. Hugs. Brilliant. Thanks so much. Well done. Talk to you soon. Yeah, and you can too. So what are you, what, how are you, how are you feeling right now? Um, <laughs> really happy, I guess. I don't know why I'm so upset in a good way. <laughs> I kind of feel relieved that it's over. Um, but it just really, I feel like it's been a lot of really hard work and I'm feeling good. <laughs> you have to put yourself in uncomfortable situations and just be proud of who you are and do whatever you can to prepare yourself. It might not always seem like it's enough, but you gotta take the first step. You just gotta show up. That's the hardest part and you'll do it. Believe in yourself. You'll do just fine. I did my Federation A license when I was younger in the 90s, and there were two women at the license with 50 men. You know, and Tracy's in that same thing breaking grounds, being a pioneer 20 years Try later. Try to collect the ball like this every time. For me, my idols were all someone I didn't know. The girls get to see Tracy and you can strive to be someone. You have a physical idol, it's tangible. You can reach it, you can, you can achieve it. They're looking up to people like Tracy and it's exciting to see her being prepared to kind of forge the path because they certainly will be prepared to follow. Being with
with Tracy, like I tell people that's what I want to be. Like that's who I want to be when I grow up. She has instilled like something in me that no one else has. She makes me want to win so much more and she just brings so much energy and competitiveness to the game and I love her. <laughs> love that about her. Francisco State tonight ended on a penalty kick, and the Gators' Nikki Rookie makes the final stop to clinch a 3-2 win for the women in the first round of the conference championship. The Gators now head to UC San Diego. You know, Tracy wow. Ann, hired in 2015, has never had a losing season. I've never hoped for something more than I've worked for it, right? And that's what I've tried to give to you guys. You bought in, right? And every single day, every game, every training, you guys have gotten a little bit better. And now you're here and you have this incredible momentum moving forward, right? You're prepared, you're confident, right? You're ready. I've never been more confident in a team than right now. Okay, exactly where you are. You've, you've done everything to prepare to get to this point, right? This game is yours. Go out, let's give them something to talk about, yeah? Thank you, Nico. Good, Nico. Good Good push up the line, Gators. Yeah, get up. Let's go, Gators. <coughs> Hi everyone, are we back? Can everyone hear me? Yeah, okay, good. Awesome. Um, so I have to admit, that's the first time I've actually watched that. I know I said uh, before that I saw it a lot, but the first time I've watched it, like in the past year, um, that brought up some stuff, man, um, in a good way. Um, so I'm happy to have shared that with all of you. Um, kind of, yeah, emotional. Normally I only cry at the two times, but I cried like three times and got to turn my camera off. Um, but what I kind of just want to get into, um, we have about 25 minutes, um, is there'll be time to kind of ask me some questions at the end. But really, um, probably the two questions that I get asked the most um, after seeing the film is usually the first one is why uh, in the very beginning of the film do I get emotional uh, reading the poem? Um, 
And I probably didn't explain it well enough, um, or we obviously have to condense footage into something, but I, I didn't know that my mom had saved that poem and I didn't even remember writing it. Um, and when uh, the directors, uh, Jordan and Matt gave it to me to read, it was the first time that I was reading it in you know, almost 20 years. Um, and that one part where I said, when I'm on the field, I'm in heaven. Um, it just made me feel like that still holds so true to me. Um, and it just, here I am getting emotional. Um, it just like, it just showed me at the time reading it, how powerful soccer is and how much I love being on the field. And obviously then I was a player, but now I'm a coach, but whatever capacity that I'm in, um, I just still love it. Um, okay. Anyway, this was not supposed to happen. So anyway, we're back. Um, so the second question um, that I normally get asked is just kind of above and beyond, um, like, why did I go to Wales? And I know we kind of touch on it, um, you know, because I got denied, you know, into the US, the C course that I wanted to be waived into. And so that's kind of the simple answer, right? Is because US soccer said I couldn't move into the C. Um, but I think just the more complex answer for me is, you know, is like, I just felt like, get out of my way. Like you're in my way and I'm trying to win. Um, and that was the next best option was, all right, if you're gonna tell me no, I'm gonna find something that's better. Um, and ultimately at the core of who I am, and I know that there's a couple former players on here and, and people that I've coached with, which I know they can speak to this is really at the core of who I am is I'm a, I'm a competitor um, and I'm a knowledge seeker. And if there's information that I need or that can help me win um, or provide a better experience for the people around me, I want that. I want that information. And um, I'm just not someone that wants to wait to be great at something. Like I want to be great now and I value excellence. Um, of course, you know, with my, with my players and, you know, my friendships and things like that, but first and foremost, I value excellence within myself because that's part of who I am as a coach and who I am as a person is I expect people around me to be great also, but I, I expect myself to help propel, um, my, the people around me into greatness also. And it's like, I have to have that high of an expectation for myself. Um, and I think that being the competitor that I am, um, not only did I feel like I was like competing against like U S soccer or something, but granted their, their waiver rules were not malicious. They weren't like trying to deny, you know, women into coaching. It was like, they wrote the rule for men ultimately. And that's, they didn't even consider that women would want to, um, you know, pursue those licenses or maybe that there would be some restrictions, but, um, I just, I just want to compete and I want to win and I want to, I want to be great and not just for me, but I want to be the best coach that I can possibly be for my players um, and for my staff. And that's part of my role is to be a mentor, not just to uh, the players, but, you know, I want young female coaches and young male coaches to be fair um, that are going to be allies and advocates of ours to, to want to be great also and to teach them. Um, and if I have to be the first person to do something, um, as scary as that is, uh, I, I feel like the more adversity and the more challenges that we face in our life, the more confidence that we gain. And the only way to get confident at doing anything is honestly to fail at something and then to come back better and stronger the next time. So, um, you know, I went there on a whim thinking that, you know, I might fail at this and I might not be good enough, especially when I walked into the room and saw, you know, Roberta Martinez and, and Terry Henry and Mikel Arteta and Peter Crouch. I had this like moment of like, what am I, like, what am I even doing here? Like how, like who invited me? Um, but once I, you know, gave myself a shot and bet on myself, um, I became a better coach, but ultimately my players got a better coach. Um, and that to me is really, really important. And it was fun because the feedback that I got was, when I came back from just doing the UEFA B, um, my assistant coach at the time, Val Henderson, who you see in the film, um, her and I have known each other since we were like eight years old. Um, we're very, very good friends. And 
give each other a lot of shit and um we were you know never on the same team always competitors but when I came back from Wales and I ran a couple sessions I mean after practice she's like looking at me like like what happened there because you are like a completely different coach um and so that kind of segues into something that I've been asked you know a lot by soccer coaches and I know not everybody on this call is an actual soccer coach um but they want to know like what's the biggest difference between um the U.S. Soccer Federation coaching licenses and the UEFA approach. Um, and I've done the, I did the U.S. Soccer B license. I haven't done the A license, so I can't speak to that. Um, I, I was licensed out after doing like four and four years. So um, maybe at some point, um, although I'm hoping they let me skip that now and just go straight into the U.S. Pro license, but that's another conversation. I feel like I've earned it, but anyway. Um, so the biggest difference between the UEFA courses and the US courses um, is the way that I kind of describe it um, in simple terms is it's one's like, you know, you're getting an education and the other one, you're just getting a license. Um, and that's not to say that one is, has more value than the other. Um, but I felt like the experience doing the US licenses is like, it's, you have, you like, you have to have one. And so people go in with the mindset of like, I'm doing this because I have to do it. And that's kind of how it's treated in some ways. Whereas like the UEFA licensing, it, it felt like everybody there wanted to learn from each other. Um, and it was much more of a open environment of like sharing information. There wasn't as much like ego in the room, I guess I, I would say, um, you know, and not everybody, not every US course is like that either, but you know, just being again, like a female, like the only female in both courses, um, you know, with one other female or two other females, it's that that's the way that it can it can feel. Um, and so in terms of the information that you're receiving, um, it really just came down. The biggest difference was the, the delivery. Um, and what I mean by that is like the UEFA way of doing things is like there's no fluff. There's no like heavy wording. Um, it's really, really simple. Like they they coach the game. And I know that just sounds so silly because that's what we do. But they you watch soccer you extract detail or a theme or a moment from the game, you replicate it on the training pitch. I mean, that sounds really simple, but there's all these different layers and elements in US soccer education um, where they give you stage one should look like this and stage two is the experimentation phase and stage three, that stuff doesn't exist. And I'm not saying one is better or worse, they're just very different. Um, so UEFA has like kind of a couple different modules that they use, like there's half pitch sessions, phase of play sessions, multi-directional sessions, um, but everything always relates back to 11 v 11. And so when you're building out your sessions in UEFA, whatever the detail is that you want from the game, if you want, if you watch the game and you see that you're playing a 3-5-2 system versus a 4-4-2 system, and there's a mismatch in the wide, you know, the wide area um you know in the final third and you want to work on how to defend against that you're taking that exact moment and you're you're creating a training session about it and you're trying to replicate exactly what you see there's no you know you're not like let's do this stage one of that you're, you're just like in in the drill like you're in the exercise of how do you create what they call if thens so if this happens then this is the solution and so it's very very simplified um, there's not fluff. It's just, this is what you see and this is how you fix it. And you can kind of build, you know, a session around that. Um, and that's to me, probably the biggest difference, um, outside of just kind of the level of like professionalism. And I know that has to do predominantly with, you know, funding and probably geographical location. Like obviously Wales is a very, very small country. Um, and so they can host one, you know, coaching course at the national training center where everybody has access to United States is enormous, right? So you're going to have to have different pockets. It's going to have to be over a long period of time or in different locations. And it might not be, you know, at our U S national training center, right. Uh, in Chula Vista or down at StubHub or wherever, you know, it, it, it is, um, it's, like they're, they're at dorms, right? They're on college campuses, they're whatever, however we can provide as much access to people as possible, which I don't think is a bad thing, um, but it's just a little bit of a different environment when you're looking at um, just kind of the professionalism um, that's required. So that's probably the biggest thing. Um, 
the last thing that I want to talk about before I introduce uh, my very good friend and longtime, um, I guess, coach, um, JT, is just advice to young coaches um, or any coach, really. And I think the, the two things that I want to speak to is um, just because things have been done one way doesn't mean it's the right way and the only way. And I think that when we're trying to go through the coaching process of figuring out who are we as a coach and what, what do I want to embody? What do I want to represent? Who am I? The more in tune that you can, and the more real and authentic that you can be, the more, um, I guess like the more profound impact you're going to have on your team. Cause I think when I first started to coach, I thought I had to be a certain way, right. I had to be like the coaches that I had and a lot of it, you know, like yelling or like just really, really intense all the time. And like kind of this, like no bullshit type attitude, which that isn't me. I, I am super intense. I'm very competitive, but I'm also really bubbly and I like to have fun and like laugh and joke. And once I started to realize that that's okay to do things the way that I want to do and the response that I was getting from my players um, was so much better, the more comfortable that I got giving out information and executing, you know, different skills and, you know, breaking down games and explaining it in a way that made sense to them. Cause it doesn't really matter if I understand it, they have to understand it. Um, you know, and so it, I, I stopped being like, well, if you don't get it, then like, you know, that's your problem. It's like, well, no, it actually is my problem because I'm the coach and I need you to understand this. So let's break this down and explain it how you can, you know, how it's going to make sense for you. Um, so be you, um, you know, do things that are comfortable that are in your wheelhouse until you get more confident and gain more experience. Um, but you don't have to coach outside of yourself. You don't have to be something that you don't feel comfortable being. Um, just be, be you. Um, the second piece is just seek opportunities to learn. Um, I think in the sports world, it's hard to admit when we don't know something or we feel like we have to like flex on people or, um, you know, just like carry this kind of like, and I don't want to say like an ego, but there has to be a little bit of a chip on your shoulder. Like I know what I'm doing. It's, it's a competitive environment. Um, but I felt like the more vulnerable that I was and the more vulnerable that I am and I ask questions, the more information that I get and the better coach that I am. And I think that being vulnerable with other coaches and asking those questions actually lets everybody's guard down. And just the, the free flow of information is so much better. Um, and you allow other people to ask questions also. And I, I think that when you go to clinics and you, you watch other training sessions, or even if you're watching videos and YouTube, you know, things online, um, language is really important. And I think a skill that I've probably focused on the most the past five years isn't necessarily watching a game and like knowing what adjustments to make, like by changing a formation or like making a sub, like that's just experience playing the game, watching the game. But what I've learned the most is how to explain one concept 10 different ways. Um, because we all learn in different ways and we all need to visualize and see things in a different way. And when you go to clinics and you watch other sessions, like that's the one thing that you can always take away is, all right, I'm trying to teach a player how to open up their body to the field when they receive the ball, body open to the field. Okay. That's not the same. Like people are like, I don't know. I, my body is open to the field. Okay. Well, you're not turning your body to open up to the field. So you have to think of a different way to describe that. Right. So for me, okay. Hey, when you receive the ball, I want you to be able to see three flags. Okay. That's a, now I have a visual right now. I'm looking for two corner flags and the corner flag on the opposite side. So that means I really have to open up, but just that really small change can really impact a player in the way that they see the game. And so those are the things that I, I tell young coaches to look at the most is how do you say the same thing in a lot of different ways? Um, because you're going to be a good coach. You're going to know what changes in the system to make or what formation you should roll with based on your personnel. It's really just kind of the small subtleties of the game that make you good to great, um, in my opinion. So those are my little, my little takeaways. Um, but I would like to um, bring on, because I think another part of the movie, obviously, is having advocates and allies and people that are there to support you because you really can't do stuff by yourself. Like as much as I'd like to be like, Trace, you did that all on your own. Like I really very much did not in a big way. I have a huge support network. Um, 
this man, uh, JT Hanley being one of them. Um, so I have two questions for him. Um, there he is. And uh, do you wanna say anything before I ask you questions? Oh, so much. Um, the one thing I would just dovetail on something you said, Tracy, is you know, be yourself. And I would say that to the to the players on this uh, call. I'm happy to see there are a ton of my uh, uh, high school players and their families on this call. Be yourself. Uh, Tracy said she tried to dovetail herself into what a mold of a coach should look like. Okay, and uh, although I've never been a female coach. I know one of the big things is, you know, don't cry, don't be emotional, that that stigma, right, that you don't want to open up. Well, Tracy is a, a very emotional, very expressive person, very passionate person. So I love in the movie that she cries because that's who she is. I, I mean, she's been that way as long as I've known her and that's a long time. But she doesn't worry about, oh, oh that's really going to undercut my competitiveness or my competence. It actually enhances it because it comes across as being authentic and real. Her players recognize that and that enhances your, uh, your truth uh, bearing to them. So I think that that's for people that were watching the film, when you see her break down at the end, um, that's a good thing, right? Because that, that is Tracy Ham in addition to also being that same competitor that knocked that little kid over earlier in the movie, which I find funny every time I watch it, so. Yes, fair. That is still me. Um, 100%. Um, well, thank you. And um, so my first question to JT is, um, and I love that there's a lot of men watching this film also that's like speaks volumes, um, is as an ally to women and girls in soccer, what is your advice or insight to other men in the space that want to be an advocate as well? Um, you know, this could probably be a, a whole thing on its own, but to boil it down, I think there's, it's like a dichotomy. There's two parts of it. The first thing you have to do for yourself is you have to become knowledgeable, right? There are still a lot of men out uh, just in the world in general, certainly in the soccer world that are unaware that there are actually uh, gender equality and gender equity issues. Uh, you need to inform yourself, right? You need to read, you need to study, you need to, to, to bone up on these things so that you become knowledgeable and hopefully that leads to a sense of empathy, right? So that you can put yourself in the place of the young women that you're coaching, the adult women that you're coaching, whatever level you're at, right? So that you really understand that these things do exist in society and you have to recognize them, identify them before you can help to address them. You know, one of the things I've done in two of the high schools that I've been at is to get rid of diminutives, right? So I've thrown out two sets of uniforms that were lady monarchs, lady dragons. It, we're either gonna be dragons or monarchs or we're not gonna be anything, but we're not having uniforms that diminish our importance. We're equally as important as the men's soccer team or the football team or the golf team or anything else, right? So that's a, that's a step. The flip side of it is, is that you wanna create an environment within your program, the teams you work with, where, where the, the players own it right? They help create the culture. I always have believed that empowering the players to define their culture, what they value, uh, as opposed to imposing my structure on them. Um, and then letting that culture go from one year to the next year, new players come in uh, and the, 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 the women in the team mentor them, right? They teach them the culture, they teach them the values so that it, it, it doesn't end up being coach centric, it's program centric, but really what it is is community centric. And that group of, of women actually create the environment and the values that, that they share and move with. So I think those are probably the two most important things that you can do as a male coach in, a, in an environment where you're working with female athletes. Awesome. Um, second question. How has coaching women for over 30 years, I didn't mean to age you with that, but I just did it anyway, you're welcome. Um, how has coaching women for over 30 years impacted your personal and professional life? What are your biggest takeaways from helping to elevate the women's game? It's probably a really good thing that a lot of my players' cameras are off because they would have been laughing and that would have been running at the next session. So um, 
It's an interesting question. And I mean, this is funny because you and I have talked about this a billion times over the years. So I'm actually going to turn it the other way. I was lucky to be brought up in a family of very strong, educated, opinionated, assertive women. And then also men who weren't threatened by that. Right. So my the the archetype that I grew up with as a as a child and then a young man was different than maybe a lot of what the cultural norms were. So it actually took me a while to understand that, you know, that's not normal in our society. Um, that helped me a lot because it didn't inhibit me from from believing that competence wasn't down to gender, uh, you know, intelligence, uh, articulance wasn't down to the gender. It was down to something that anybody could aspire to develop and grow, right? So for me personally, I think uh, one of the things that it, I, I've been able to naturally in the classroom, on the field and whatnot, continue that because it's normal for my experience, literally as far back as I can remember. I, I didn't know that my mom and my grandmother, my great grandmother, my aunt, my cousins were all strong women. I just, they were, they didn't need to wait for my dad to come home to go talk to the guy down at the garage about fixing the car. Um, and so my mindset is, is that your ability to, to own your own experience, create your own reality, define yourself from the inside out as opposed to the outside in is probably different. Um, but I now understand that because of that, uh, I have to constantly remind myself that I have a responsibility to the, the young women that I work with to, to keep reminding them about Title IX, that there was a time when the things that they take for granted now that are ubiquitous, didn't exist. Uh, one of the things I, I used to do when I was teaching English way back in the dark ages is I would encourage a lot of my junior players that would write their junior year term paper, do it on a Title IX topic mm -hmm. so that you can actually educate yourself about how we got to where we're at right now and what had to happen before that. Um, so just any type of opportunity you have to raise the awareness of your players, the awareness of your colleagues, uh, and certainly the, you know, your own self-awareness. I think those things have been a constant in my, in my coaching and my teaching career and, and in my personal life as well. I mean, I hang out with people like you, Tracy. So <laughs> that's true. You're welcome for that, by the way. Thank um. you. Awesome. Um, thank you so much. Um, JT, just to context that um, I, he, I could, he, I played against him from like U10 to, well, not against him. He was the coach of the team that I played That would against. have been awkward. <laughs> that would have been weird. Um, like U10 to, I mean, gosh, all the way through like, all, yeah, youth soccer all the way through high school. Um, and then um, now he is my coach of my women's team. Um, and you know, I'm 37 and I still need a soccer coach and JT is the man and I'm, I'm very happy to have him in my life. So um, thank you. And um, we don't have too much time left, but if anybody has any questions um, for me or for JT or our directors, hi, Matt and Jordan are on here. I'm so excited. Um, yeah, if you have any other questions, let me know. Trace, there are a couple questions that okay. came in through the chat. I can read them off to you if that's helpful. So one from Maddie Holmberg, who I think is also on your screen. Maddie, actually, do you want to read your question aloud? You're welcome to. Uh, sure, I can do that. Uh, hi, Tracy. I'm Maddie. Nice, hi, Maddie. nice to meet you. You too. Um, so uh, it's interesting. I've, I've never actually played soccer before, but I'm super passionate about it. And, you know, watch all the games, all that stuff. Um, do you think that I still have the potential to become a coach or, or be involved somehow in that respect? Oh my gosh. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's actually one of the, I want to say one of the things, but the way that us soccer has actually developed the grassroots license, um, is like exactly for, um, people that maybe never have played the game, but have certainly like loved it, or they know someone that loves it, that wants to play it. And the way that they've built their grassroots coaching license is actually really, really phenomenal. I, I really am on board with it. 
Um, and that's kind of a great starting point, honestly, is to once you do your grassroots or you get involved with one of the um, like the recreational clubs in your area, they always need volunteers. And that's a great place to start. Um, but yeah, you I mean, honestly, if you love the game, like there is a place for you on the field, because as a coach, I will be honest, even if I had coaches that, you know, knew the game inside and out, but they weren't necessarily passionate about it. I got way more from the coaches that maybe weren't the most elite level coaches, but loved what they were doing. Um, like you're able, I think as a coach, yeah, you can coach the game, but ultimately like your job is to impact a young person's life in a positive way. Um, and if you love the game and you're a huge fan, you are, you probably watch more soccer than I do. That's amazing. I, there's definitely a place for you on the field somewhere. I, people will be lucky to have you. Thank you so much. No problem. Awesome. And JT, you're welcome to chime in on anything as well if you wanted to. Another question that came in, Tracy, someone in the film said, and then there's one more after this. Mm -hmm. Someone in the film said from Adrian. Oh, Adrian, I actually think you're, you're also on camera. If you want to ask your question aloud as well, you're welcome to. But if not, I'm happy to read it through. Sure. Um, so Tracy, my question is, uh, someone in the film said, all my idols are someone I didn't know. I think it was Brittany Cameron. Um, so my question is, who was your idol that you didn't know? And do you still have a chance to meet them someday? I so have you asked this because I love telling this story. Yay. Okay, good. Um, sorry, I still get just as excited for people that told you this before. But um, so obviously sharing a last name with like arguably the best female soccer player of all time, Mia Hamm was like, she was my idol. Like I thought I was... I used to lie when I was little and like say that Mia was like my aunt and my sister, you know, when you have to check in with the referees, they go, Tracy Ham, are you related to Mia? I'm like, mm -hmm. you know, obviously not. Um, but Mia Ham, like certainly was, you know, when I was growing up, she was like the Alex Morgan of that era, right? She was all of everything. She had the Pert Plus ad, loved her. Um, but definitely Mia. Um, and so in 2017, so in April, um, thank you, Courtney's on here. Um, she sent me to um, LA to go to one of the US Soccer Foundation events, fundraisers, and they had a bunch of the US Women's National Team players there. It was a big dinner and all the things. And I know Brandy Chastain really well. Um, she's like local from the Bay Area and I got to play in a bunch of teams with her. Um, and so I saw her. And I was like, oh, Brandy. And like, I saw Mia behind Brandy. And like, I was like, I knew that she was there and I was going to be really calm and like professional. Like I'm a big girl now. And like, I coach soccer and I'm like, kind of a big deal. Like we can do this, Tracy. Like, it'll be fine. You have something to share. So I see Brandy and like, I'm like, is that Mia? And she's like, yes, do you want to meet her? And I was like, oh my God, yes, I do. And so she, Brandy's like, oh, this is Tracy. And, you know, Mia's like, hi. And I was like, we have the same last name. And you're like my favorite person of all time ever. I had posters of you on my wall everywhere. And all I want to do is go to North Carolina and like be like you. And I like spit all of that out in like 10 seconds. And she just like looked at me and she's like, that's so cool. We have the same name. She gives me a hug, no joke, and goes, it's a ham sandwich. I died. Like I could have died right there and been like, all right, life is over. We are in a good spot. Um, so meeting Mia was like, absolutely one of the coolest things that's ever happened to me for sure in like all of my life. So thank you. I love telling that story because it like gives me the feel goods, you know? We have one more, um, question that had come in and I also want to shout out Angela Bailey, who is with scores, um, to you, um, Maggie, uh, Maddie, excuse me, because if you didn't see that in the chat, yes, get after volunteer coaching. It's so available and they do a really great job. Um, okay, this one came from Chuck Carlson and I don't know if Chuck's up here, so I'll read it out. Chuck says, you mentioned coaching les lessons in UEFA had a lot of, if this happens, then do this. In these coaching sessions, oh, Chuck, I see you now. <laughs> um, you can finish it out if you'd like. 
Hello, thank you. So you talked about the if then. Mm -hmm. um, how did they teach you or try to coach you for a player like Messi or Marta that is so creative, there is no if then, or did if they even try? Yeah, you know, and that's actually something that a lot of people ask, right? Is like, oh, you got, if there's a special player, how do you make the game more black and white? Because soccer is such a fluid sport. There's no timeouts. You know, how do you navigate really unique skill set? Um, and exactly what you said, there isn't really an answer for some of those things. I think it's like, if he dribbles at you, turn and run at your own goal, all of our plan is off, right? Like there's no solution to that. Um, and I think when you, when you talk about if thens in a training session, it's just the, they're looking for the commonalities and the trends that occur over and over and over again. And you're planning for those instances until something is created, or there's a creative player that goes against everything that you try to train. <laughs> Awesome. Thank Thanks so much, Tracy. You are a rock star. I want to give both you and JT a final opportunity to share any last words with our attendees. And then Paul, I will give it to you to close us out. But once again, thanks to everyone for being here and get after the Women in Soccer Network. So I'm going to just say uh, that uh, publicly, this is the part where I get to embarrass you. Uh, I'm super proud of uh, everything that you're doing, everything you've accomplished. Um, I'm, I'm super grateful that a lot of players that I know that are on this call get a chance to listen to you because I think that you're an amazing mentor uh, and, and someone to aspire to, like Brittany had mentioned. Um, I also want to give a shameless plug out. Tracy talked about uh, UEFA and the United States Soccer Federation. There's another organization here in the country it used to be called the National Soccer Coaches Association of America. It's now called United Soccer Coaches. If there are any aspiring coaches, Maddie, uh, you can go online to United Soccer Coaches. And uh, similar to the way that Tracy described it being very um, uh, education centered and collaborative, uh, that's one of the big differences, I think, between uh, United Soccer Coaches and the United States Soccer Federation. It's, it's very, it's, it's there to teach you how to teach your players. Um, and I'm a big believer in their program as well. So, and thank you, Tracy, and thank you all for including me in this. It was a lot of fun. Absolutely. Um, parting words. Um, don't wait to be great. That's it. Time is now. Get after it. Thank you so much, Tracy. That's some incredible parting words, actually, and good for all of us to have a good opportunity to come right out of the gate right now out of this call, maybe, and, and follow that. So I want to say thank you again so much again to you, Tracy, and to you, JT, uh, for coming on and being able to give us this incredible experience. It's been, you know, better than we could ever hope for hearing about all those things. So uh, thank you so much, everybody on as well, for asking questions and coming on and being a part of this. Uh, again, everybody here at America Scores One really appreciates that. And if you want to learn more about us at America Scores and what we're doing to support kids, uh, can, we're going to follow up with you individually, but also just America Scores Bay Area.org is going to be a great place to look and find all that information uh, to hear more about what we're doing and become a part of the movement that we're all coming together to try to make happen. So thank you so much, everybody. I hope you'll have a a great evening and, and come back and be part of all of our next events coming up.